Hey everyone, it's Christy, and welcome to another episode of An Atheist Asks. On today's episode, I'm very excited to have Karen Garst, who is a blogger at the website faithlessfeminist.com, and editor and compilator and driver of a new and upcoming book on women, 17 women's journeys away from religion. And so first I'd like to say, Karen, welcome. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, I'm happy to be here, Christy. Thank you. Yes. So to let people who are watching know, can you tell us a little bit about first your atheism and then we'll talk about how it connects to feminism and how those two kind of value systems come together for you. So Great. starting. Uh, well, I was born in Bismarck, North Dakota, <laughs> and so I was raised as a Lutheran. And frankly, I think if I didn't belong in church, uh, didn't belong uh, to a church in high school, I would have had no social life. We had a lot of activities associated with church, um, whether it was roller skating or bowling. Uh, we had a high school group called the Luther League. Um, so it did provide a lot of social activity for me. And I think that's one of the um, issues around religion is it provides community. Um, then I went to Wisconsin for graduate school. I did a PhD in curriculum and instruction. And to me, church was about family and knowing everyone else in the pews. And so I really didn't join a church then. I didn't have a lot of friends who went to church. So I kind of drifted away. Um, eventually, after moving to Oregon, I did join Augustana Lutheran Church in Northeast Portland, and I was married there. And then uh, my husband, who had been a kind of a lapsed Catholic, <laughs> and I decided to join a, a new thought church called Living Enrichment Center, which was, you know, all passed to God, et cetera. It wasn't dogmatic at all. And when that went under in 2004, I'd been reading a lot of the books of the Jesus Seminar and uh, pretty much decided I was an atheist. So that was about 20 years ago. Okay. And do you remember um, sort of when you started with the Jesus Seminar, what your reactions were to it and, and what it made you think about? Well, the, the first thing, I'll go back a little. Um, when I went to Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, which was a Lutheran college, my first class in Religion 101, I was astounded to, to learn about all the different oral um, strains that went into the Old Testament, the P, the E, the J, and how linguistically they were able to determine that, and it came at different times. So that really opened to me to the history, I think, of religion as something that was historical, not just a book of stories. Um, so that that was a that was a start. The Jesus Seminar was obviously more sophisticated. Uh, it was in the mid '90s, and I can tell you that when I read Bishop uh, Shelby Splong's book, uh, Resurrection Myth or Reality, that was my aha moment. You know, when he said, "Look, there probably wasn't a real resurrection, um, but here's." Uh, what the apostles were doing and they came back and said there's good news anyway when I let go of that concept the resurrection I would classify myself as an atheist right and I know for people who leave religion depending um, it's, it's often a fight between the head and the heart because if you're raised in it and you get a lot of emotional stability from it and you feel a lot of comfort from it or your social networks are very heavily in influenced by you're involved in it uh, and then to walk away there's sort of people seem to have the rational side first those aha moments here but then they lag a little bit did you feel any kind of emotional fallout as as you were going through the process well i, I was very gradual and it wasn't traumatic at all <laughs> and we were attending this church and i put that in quotation marks my mother-in-law came to a service once and she said um, about the minister she said well that that was a really good talk but i wouldn't call it a sermon and she's a devout catholic <laughs> so it was you know it was kind of coming sunday and hearing here's some things you can do to live a better life uh, so it was very unreligious, if you will. So uh, we just drifted through that. And then when it uh, caved, we were already out, I think, um, as atheists. So can you tell us a similar story about your feminism? Because I know for myself, you know, like I became increasingly aware of women's injustices as I grew older and that really shaped um, why I am a feminist. So I'm kind of curious, you know, we do a lot on deconversion of how people come to atheism, but we don't do a lot on how people come to feminism. So maybe you could tell a little bit of that story too, if you don't mind. Uh, well, um, I'll tell you one point where I really had a huge aha moment. Um, I was a senior at Concordia and I decided to go to graduate school and I applied for a scholarship at the 
uh, from Concordia, I'm assuming, or some alumni or something like that. And it was to Dartmouth. And I went into the interview all perky and <laughs> um, I'd done a lot of speaking. So I felt very confident. I had, you know, almost a four point. Um, and the committee, there was one woman on the committee and she said to me, why should we give it to you? You're just going to get married and have kids. Whoa. And, oh, yeah. And I just, you know, I've thought since then of a lot of responses I would give to her, but I was really astounded. I mean, it really, I had a step back. Um, you know, it was in the late 60s. So there were a lot of political things going on, even in, even in Moorhead, Minnesota. <laughs> and uh, I was really surprised um, by that. Then by the time I went to grad school, graduate school in Madison, Wisconsin in the 70s, it was very political. I learned a lot. There were a lot of feminist activities. Um, I went to different groups at the National Organization of Women it sponsored. Um, and so I read more and I, I got more active. Um, I was just surrounded by people who were very, very political. Mm. And so then these two things have now in your life come together um, and are moving you toward activism. So how do those, how does feminism and atheism come together for you? Well, um, what happened last summer when the U.S. Supreme Court issued its decision in Burwell v. Hobby Lobby, where because of the previous Citizens United decision, they decided that Hobby Lobby had been defined as a person and had certain rights. They decided that Hobby Lobby, because of the religious beliefs of its owners, did not have to provide certain forms of birth control to its employees through the Affordable Care Act. And I really became incensed. I, you know, we fought for birth control. I remember before there was birth control and dealing with that and uh, the right to an abortion with Roe v. Wade in 1973. And I thought, oh, it's 40 years later, we're still fighting about that. And I was having lunch with a friend of mine who's an author. And she said, oh, Karen, you should write a book. And I said, oh, well, the only thing I could get passionate about was atheism. And I had never, after my husband and I left this church and the church collapsed, um, sought out any humanist groups. Um, I didn't feel that sense of community. I was working full time. So was my husband. We had a, um, a son. And I just didn't feel the need for community and frankly, like sleeping in on Sundays. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but when I decided to write the book, um, in order to secure authors, I reached out to a lot of groups and uh, was able to meet people. And I'm sure some of these women will be friends for life. Uh, and it's just been a fascinating experience and particularly dealing with some of my authors who had very traumatic experiences in religion. Right. So the first idea in terms of activism was sort of to lift up women's voices uh, to be heard in their experiences. And why was it important for you that it was women's voices in this case? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, I was introduced uh, by a friend of mine, uh, Steve Goldman, uh, to Peter Bogosian, who has written a book, Manual for Atheists. And uh, both of them uh, were real mentors to me during this process. And they suggested it might be a good idea to just do women exclusively. Uh, there are a lot of men's voices in atheism, the Four Horsemen, um, as you know, with Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, and the late uh, Christopher Hitchens. They get a lot of play. Um, if you look at debates on YouTube, they're mostly men. And I did, as a process of studying for this book, I surveyed Amazon books on atheism, and out of the hundred that received the most reviews, only six were written by women. So I decided that it'd be a really good idea to focus on women's voices. Um, I think they have something unique to say, and I think it has a lot to do with the culture. Um, most of the leading atheists uh, come from science or philosophy. And they look less at the cultural issues, although Dawkins has certainly to, to an extent. But why do women in particular uh, seem to cling longer, if you will, to religion? What is it about that community and women um, that makes it a little harder for them to leave? Plus, I also think it's important to have role models who you can identify with. And I think women who are thinking of leaving the church, leaving religion, if they see other women who've gone through a similar experience, whose experiences are going to be unique from men, um, they will be more encouraged to, um, to do it. So it's a support for them.
Yeah, I definitely agree. I think on, on the one hand, you know, when you don't see women in those spaces and you notice it, there's sort of an obligation like, okay, are you going to put yourself forward? Because, you know, you could put yourself you know, into those those spaces. Um, and so on the one side, there there is the women's agency of women stepping up and into these roles, which is part of the reason why I wanted to do my channel was I looked around the atheist community on YouTube. I saw a lot of good stuff. But for instance, I've got um, a video that I want to work on in the next few days about the lack of any discussion of consent or the age of consent in the Bible when it comes to sex. And if this is supposed to be a manual from God, how could human sexuality in terms of when is it a child and when is it a consenting adult not come up? Um, and so, but then I realized, well, that's kind of like, a, you know, I'm looking at it from a feminist perspective. And if I want those perspectives out there, then I need to step up and be that voice. On the other side, then that's the, on the side of the community is to make space for people's voices and to be welcoming and encouraging and um, it, it broaden what it means to be an atheist with, with every new person. So I'm, I'm really glad that you are bringing this book forward because I think you're right in terms of role models, seeing other women, hearing their stories and being able to relate maybe on some life issues um, that are exclusively, you know, in the, in the purview of women, like perhaps childbirth or those kinds of experiences or, or dealing with sisters in some kind of, you know, um, feminine way of bonding, then the other people can relate to that. And then it doesn't seem so alien. They don't feel quite so alone. So when it comes to the stories, are there any in the book that you kind of like to preview a little bit to um, show the variety or some of the um, stories that are going to be coming out? Well, um, yes, I'll be happy to, and I, I can actually read a couple excerpts if you'd like. Oh, yeah, um, excellent. <laughs> there's quite a variety of backgrounds that people have come from, and they've been raised, um, three of the people uh, come from Europe and emigrated to the United States, so they have really different experiences because most of them were raised in a more secular home. And, and so their experiences once they get to the United States is interesting. One of my friends, who is British said, golly, you know, in Britain, when you ask directions, they'll tell you to the nearest pub. And when I came to the United States, people tell you to the nearest church. I don't know where any of the churches are. <laughs> that, was, that was a big opening for her. Um, but uh, people were raised in Texas, Minnesota, California. So they kind of preview different parts of the United States. They are from a lot of different faiths. I have one woman who is Jewish, which is about the you know, percentage, uh, one out of 17 in the population. And then from mainstream, you know, Lutheranism all the way to Jehovah's Witness, uh, Mormon, uh, et cetera. And some of them, as I said earlier, they're really traumatic experiences. Um, let me just read a couple, if you'd like. Please do, I yes. Okay. Um, this is from Anna. She was born in Texas and eventually joined the Mormon church. As a kid, I didn't learn much about religion, and I don't remember ever praying together as a family. There must have been some praying, at least for a little while anyway. My parents had given up on going to church shortly after my oldest brother was born. My mom wanted to join the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, but my dad at the time wouldn't hear of it. He was the man. He had the ultimate authority. From what my mother told me, he was an oppressive, controlling, proud Irish Catholic who was overly ambitious and demoralizing. Keep in mind, I only have my mother's side of the story to go on because my father was murdered when I was eight. Wow. So um, she goes on to talk about um, how she ended up joining the, the Mormon church and how she dealt with the trauma of her father dying. And it, it's just a, a very moving personal story. And if I can say really well written, I mean, I was just sort of like it was prayer home companion. I just wanted you to keep going. Um, but the lyrics, you know, it just sort of sets it up in a very conversational way and throws little bits of information without it being exposition. It's very, very well yeah. written. Yeah, here's, here's a little excerpt from uh, Nancy, um, who grew up in Minnesota. If God wanted to save us from our sins, I wondered, why didn't he, as the omnipotent God, just simply forgive us and send a prophet to tell us we were forgiven? Why did he instead send himself in human form to suffer and die on the cross when the act of forgiveness could have been so much neater and cleaner if he had just denounced it himself. And it always seemed to me that Jesus's gift of extreme suffering to save us from our sins seemed so overblown. Hadn't regular human beings suffered just as much for other reasons that were just as worthy? And more tellingly, for reasons that were unworthy? Why were we singling out Jesus' suffering? And weren't Jesus' miracles, the loaves and the fishes to feed the multitude, raising Lazarus from the dead, turning water to wine, weren't these miraculous acts what Christians relied upon to believe that Jesus was divine? 
And if Jesus hadn't really performed these miracles, wouldn't he just be an ordinary guy with a great philosophy and a message of compassion? So she uh, goes through and really um, digests her uh, Lutheran faith and was somebody who questioned it as a teenager. Um, and then I'll read this um, final one. And these are, these are drafts, so these are going to be changed in the final document. Um, Seal was raised in the Pacific Northwest in a devout Jehovah's Witness family. How does one begin an essay of this kind? With the typical cadence of childhood memories, followed by the angst of the teen years, moving on toward rebellion of thought and rebellion of action? Perhaps that would make most sense. However, sense was never a word used to describe me. Instead, I'll begin with this rambling of how to begin and then with this quote. You must consider him a tool of Satan. Flabbergasted, I looked back at the elder and replied, replied I, I don't see how that's possible. I don't think you understand, I love him. This isn't a crush. Jehovah is a God of love and this is love, so I don't see how that is even remotely connected to Satan. Satan is using him to draw you away from Jehovah and is disguising himself as this boy. Oh, silly Kale, you hadn't realized that you'd fallen in love with the devil. I stood my ground trying to reason and explain my feelings to this tribunal of elders, but they were not used to a logical female and didn't respond kindly to my retorts. They had expected me to come in groveling and I had naively assumed they would treat me with the respect and openness that I'd been raised to believe was owed to me. They left the room for 90 minutes to deliberate, during which time I sat alone in the back of the Kingdom Hall feeling confused, abandoned, and pissed. Believing still that God was real and his Holy Spirit was directing the men outside, I was positive my case would be dealt with justly. After all, this was my first offense in 23 years of life. Therefore, I was physically stunned when they came back declaring they wanted to disfellowship me, the highest punishment available to them. Only by the grace of one who had known me for years did they grant me a reprieve to think upon their counsel and come back repentant. And in that instant, my faith shattered. So that's just a, a sampling of uh, some of the different, certainly different stories, different styles, different backgrounds. Um, and because uh, these people aren't necessarily professional writers, I did hire um, an editor to help us who gave us developmental ed edits, meaning um, ideas for change, et cetera, and the authors made those changes. So um, I think I really raised it to a well-written level by getting that kind of help. But uh, I am amazed at the writing ability of the people that I've chosen. Yeah, I'm, I'm just sitting here in awe, and I'm, now I want to know, when is the book going to come out? <laughs> so what's the well, timetable? Uh, as you know, publishing a book is not an easy process. Um, I did uh, pitch it to several literary agents at the Willamette Writers Conference the first week in August. And then Peter Bogosian, who I mentioned earlier, um, sent the book proposal to Pitchstone, um, which published his book. It has published a number of books uh, by atheists. And uh, they asked for the manuscript. So my things, uh, fingers have been crossed for about a week, and I hope to hear back from them. But I'm very committed to this project. And if it doesn't work out to find a publisher, I will self-publish it. And I am also committed to um, starting in the Pacific Northwest, of course, um, talking about the book to groups. And um, I've already started to do that. Um, I do have a YouTube channel as well. And there I really just post the discussions I've had and the presentations I've made and that you can find it under Faithless Feminist as well. Yeah, so speaking of Faithless Feminist, nice way to segue. Let's talk a little bit about your starting on that and what your aims are for it and kind of the content you put up and what you do there. Well, again, I have to credit Peter because he told me, write, market, 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 write, market, market, market. <laughs> so um, I found a, a great consultant um, who's Dennis Lewis from Florida. He heads uh, Greenlight Digital and hired him to help me put this all together. And the first uh, name he came up with was Godless Grandmother. And I said, oh my goodness, I don't want people to know Grandmother Griffin. <laughs> One of my stepdaughters has children. <laughs> Makes me feel too old. Yeah, so, okay. yes. <laughs> faithless, faithless feminist, which is very interesting because the word feminine derives from the word for faith, fey, and the word for minimum, minus. So it was feminine was first used as a word to say women have less faith. They aren't as strong as men. 
So when you've got faithless feminine, you've got kind of a play upon words there. And I kind of like the ring of it. So I decided to, to use that and I created a blog. And the blog is at faithlessfeminist.com. Um, nobody had secured that uh, domain name yet. Funny thing about that. And each week I, I do a post. And the posts, I'm inviting people anyone listening who is interested in writing a post, 500 to 1,000 words, um, you know, researched, well-written, et cetera, can just email me um, at karen at faithlessfeminist.com and I will take a look at it. Because the blog isn't about just me, I wanna really be a forum for other people um, to contribute and share their stories. In fact, yesterday I did a post from a man in England who talked about the first female bishop in the Anglican Church and his views on that. So uh, there's also an opportunity to provide comments and have a little dialogue going back and forth on the blog as well. But I've done a variety of things um, in this year since I uh, got upset about the U.S. Supreme Court. I probably read 68 books on religion. I reread some of the ones I'd already read. And so some of the things that I'm discovering, I'm putting out there, the story of Eve, you know, how does that link to the notion of the goddess and Canaanite religion? So some of them are a little more on the academic side. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I published one that said 10 reasons why um, women should leave Christianity, again, starting out with Eve. Um, excuse me, we're responsible for evil. <laughs> and my, you're gonna- My first you're gonna video was pain saying in childhood. Eve. Yeah, I mean, my first video was, uh, was saying that Eve was the first scientist because she observed it, she thought about it, she sort of tested it out, and then she decided to, you know, test the theory that she would die. And that's not evil, that's actually the highest, you know, a thing a person can do is re reason out their world. Yeah. Um, so some are, some are current issues. Um, some are, I've got different categories, women in the church, etc. But if anyone is interested in, in writing either about their own personal experiences, I have some of those. I have people who've ri written about how to raise uh, a child. Um, I've had uh, in a secular environment, I've had uh, a woman write about um, abstinence education and how that simply doesn't work. Um, and then next week, I'm going to start by curating articles. So uh, there'll be the blog post every week and then probably three or four articles that are in the news that week that I will add an intro to and then post. So if people are interested in more information, particularly on in women and religion and feminism in that context, um, they can find it there. Yeah, that's fantastic. I actually got started with blogging doing that for the Political Studies Association Women in Politics group. And we started our website and I took over and I would go through uh, Google Alerts with, you know, women and various keywords. And then every morning, first thing is read through and then take the headline, a link and a few bits about the news article and just curate it. And I mean, I know it's a it's a nice service for people for, to go to the website because it's a, it's a very easy cost for getting a lot of information. But it's what kind of inspires me to do face palm moments it's basically the same premise that i'm doing with face palm moments and i've learned so much about topics curating articles like that in a very short period of time so that's a really great service that your blog can provide that people can just go there and go back and see the last few weeks or months worth of news and watch even watch stories develop over time the other thing that i did um through this reading is you know, I went back historically and the origins of religion. When did um, early man first uh, have a ritual about burying and they're dead? And that goes all the way back to Neanderthal. And then I did a, quite a bit of study on the mother goddess. Um, and this is a concept that grew out of archaeological studies with a lot of uh, female figurines. Um, and unfortunately, they're called Venus figurines, but um, we don't really know what they were used for. Were they part of a ritual? They're found at the front of the cave as opposed to the paintings for the hunters and the men that are found in the back of the cave. So they could have been associated with childbirth. We really don't know. Um, but I, I trace that all the way to monotheism and how did the feminine divine get eliminated? Um, so if you go to the website and subscribe, you can also for free download that ebook. It's, you know, 20, 30 pages of uh, the research I did and some of the concepts that got lost in that transition to monotheism.
Oh, that's great. Fantastic. Wow. People are going to get all kinds of stuff out of watching this <laughs> the blog, then they get the ebook, and then a book coming up. So looking toward the future, I mean, I guess two questions. First, um, how have you found your experience now that you've become more, more involved in the atheist community? And then the next one I'm going to ask is kind of where do you see things going now? But just in terms of your experience so far, like when you decided, damn it, that's it, Hobby Lobby, <laughs> straw that broke the camel's back, I'm going to kick some ass now. Um, how has it been? Well, it's been interesting. I've met a whole group of people that I really enjoy. Um, probably one of the larger groups in Portland is the Humanists of Greater Portland. And they have very interesting talks every Sunday. I don't always go. If it's something interesting, I attend. People are very welcoming to new people. Um, and they also reach out to the community. Uh, yesterday, I spent two hours with a small group from Humanists of Greater Portland sorting food at a local food bank. Um, the Sunshine Division in Portland. And um, I will tell you right now, if you donate food to a food bank, don't put a whole variety in. Just buy one thing and put it in a sack because all that has to be sorted. You kind of think, oh, I'll put it together a sack of groceries and it'll be real varied and that'll be great. But it doesn't go directly. The person has to go on shelves. So just buy one thing. <laughs> better 10 corns than every single vegetable, 10 cans of it. Exactly. <laughs> Lesson we know everyone. Volunteers who just sort it. <laughs> but that was really fun. And it was it, it, fun for me to reach out and help the community. I think I'm probably more interested in activities um, like that. As I said earlier, I don't find a, a real need to be part of a community regarding this issue. Yeah. And looking forward. Now, I know you've got the aim to finish up the book and get it out there. You've got the website going. Are you kind of looking beyond that yet? Or is it pretty much just still what's right in front of you? Well, I sent the manuscript two weeks ago um, to the editor to do the final uh, spelling, grammar, etc. And that was a big load off. Um, and then I have to concentrate on getting the book published. But my goal is really to speak to groups. And particularly, I'd like to focus on college women. Um, so I might speak at local student secular alliances. Uh, but I really want to, you know, impress upon young women that they can be anything they want to be and that religion really subordinates them, and it always has. Um, you know, maybe we'll go back to those, find uh, how those figurines were used, but certainly in recorded history, even though there's a presence of goddesses and gods, the gods have really, you know, been in charge. And I think um, women are, have been subordinated in religions, not only by the story of Eve, how they were treated, that people tend to ignore and don't look at those passages, but certainly in the church itself. I mean, um, I'll, I'll tell you a story. My uh, father was very religious and he was a deacon of the church uh, or on the church council at Trinity Lutheran. And he came home one day and he said, oh, to my mom, uh, Louise, uh, the, the wives of the people who are on the church council are in charge of putting the flowers and everything out on Sunday morning. And she says, well, I didn't sign up for that. That's your problem, not mine. <laughs> they automatically relied that the wives were going to do that. And certainly in, in the church I grew up in, the women did all the food, all the potlucks, everything. My 94-year-old mother-in-law, who's, again, a, a devout Catholic, is still doing few food organization for funerals. Um, Sonia Johnson said that, you know, her, her dream would be that uh, the, the pews are empty of women. Um, I also wrote for the book, I wrote an appendix uh, going through how women have been subordinated through religion, the Judeo-Christian tradition, and then Christianity. And I pulled um, passages in the Bible, things that have happened throughout Christianity, uh, like I'll just say, uh, just mention one, but in the Middle Ages, um, there was a edict issued, uh, a paper, whatever you want to call it, called the Malleus Maleficarum. And it basically said you can go after witches and here's how you find witches. Well, what I learned was that men were trying to enter this profession of healing, you know, when doctors first started, et cetera. Well, the women were the midwives, the women who were using herbs, et cetera, because they knew what worked and they wanted to eliminate them from the profession. I mean, from, from that healing work. And uh, that was one way they did it, was labeling them as witches and perhaps a million People were killed during that process. Very, yeah. very sad. Yeah, I um, two points on that. Just that when I hear people say the term Christian feminist, I don't get it. Because to me, like, you can be a Christian 
Like you can be a feminist, but you can't be a Christian feminist because Christianity is based on patriarchy. And feminism is based on equality. And you can't, like, you can't make the Bible do this. You can't, I mean, the texts are the texts. The texts are based, are men at the top and they use violence and force to push, to, you know, to control. And women and children are meant to submit because they're property. That's it. Like, you can't be a feminist. <laughs> um, and so I, 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 yeah, that's the thing I, I don't understand. But I want, want at some point to do a video and try to expand that out a little bit. The other thing that I thought of when you were speaking was, you know, it was uh, Marx and Engel who worked on, uh, work doing up the communist, um, it wasn't Das Kapital, it must have been Communist Manifesto, right? And Engels had actually done a, a piece of writing you might be familiar with where he talked about the way that capitalism basically takes women's labor in the home. The romanticization of love and marriage and children in the home is basically a source of free labor for the capitalist system. That, you know, in the times when men would go out, then the women would stay home and for free, take care of the kids and keep the house ready and keep him in clean underwear and make sure he had breakfast. And that was a cost that the companies got for free. And that's basically what the church has done with women's labor over the centuries as well. They've just sucked it up and not compensated them at all for it in terms of all of that organization and preparation and all of the tea making and all of the stuff you know behind behind the scenes and uh it's basically the same kind of system that capitalism uses you know in, in Engels' uh critique to get free labor out of women that's a fascinating analogy and how true yeah. i mean if women were not part of the churches um the organization would fall apart mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because, well, yes. So, but uh, getting back to your stuff, <laughs> an, an enjoyable side conversation. We'll have to do a follow up video at some point. So, um, yeah, I guess that was it. You're, um, you're going to get the manuscript uh, done and out, and then you're going to keep on uh, doing some more archiving. You're going to speak to, uh, in particularly, college age women. I, oh, I did want to say one thing. I might have mentioned this before when we talked, but I had a very positive experience with Smashwords, which is a self publishing. Thing. So, and you can, it's under your own copyright and they give you an, an IBN or IBSN number as well. And then you could just give that copyright over to the publishers. But if you didn't want to wait around, that might be an option. I have a little um, book of beginning German to English that I worked with uh, with somebody and she did the German bit and I did the English and we worked on the translation and made a little ebook. And it went very well and it's like, um, it only takes like 23 or 25% uh, sometimes even less of your profits so it's you know it goes directly into your account your uh, paypal account every month so it's a very good um i can recommend smashwords i will keep that in mind i did attend a workshop um at the willamette writers conference about self-publishing and with a whole bunch of acronyms i'd never heard of <laughs> um but the editor i'm using also can do all of that too so i will probably um get their assistance in formatting everything if I do end up self-publishing, but I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, or give me a call because, um, I mean, I can tell you how to do it and probably save you a lot of money. Um, it, it will take time, but it's actually not that complicated. It's just a little bit persnickety. Uh, but yeah, uh, we'll can talk about that off there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so is there anything that we, um, that you've, we haven't touched on that you were thinking about or like, keeping in mind to talk during the, during the show? Uh, well, I just think it's really important for women to speak up. Uh, when I first got involved in this effort, I contacted some of the women who were active in the field of atheism and said, you know, if you know women who are willing to talk up, I'll call and encourage them. And I didn't get a lot of feedback. Um, and I think it's very important for women to get out of their comfort zone, if that's what it is, and debate other people. Um, I will tell you one experience. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Bernie Deller, who's active in the uh, atheist movement, who has a uh, YouTube channel called Secular Humanism. It's Sec Hummer <laughs> is what it is. Um, and he's posted a lot of videos that I've done. We wanted to debate two women on the issue of women and Christianity. Ours, obviously, from the atheist perspective, we wrote, which means email, of course, it doesn't mean write a letter. <laughs> uh, every professor who teaches theology or religion, who is a woman in Oregon, private, public uh, seminaries, and no one would debate us. So we're going to just do it ourselves. And <laughs> that sounds interesting. <laughs> if you will. But I, I was amazed that nobody who teaches this who is a Christian, who is a woman, is willing to defend her position in a, in a local debate. 
I think it's really hard to defend, but um, yeah, that it's you know, at least to go up there and give the standard apologetics at least. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And um, I was oh, trying to think of, think of something about women and atheism, but now I've lost the thread of it. I think it was about, yeah, about calling women, you know, um, up to do this and encouraging it more. It's, uh, I, oh, I know I remember. Um, it's, you know, the idea that hmm, the atheist community it has a lot of anti-feminist sentiment in it is probably true for it's not a lot true but the people who do it are quite loud but in, in my channel um i go on about religious patriarchy quite often and i bring up the issue of the gendered nature of the text and give critiques and i mean in all honesty there's a youtuber whom i really respect the bible skeptic he doesn't comment on my videos often but the videos he comments on are the one where i'm doing a woman's take on the bible he's like i never thought about that ever in my life this is really interesting interesting. And so I think there is a place within atheism for feminist critique, maybe not like the whole feminist debate that's happening differently, but using feminist critique as applied to an atheistic perspective, because there is a lot of room for critique with religious patriarchy and all of the knock on social effects and values effects that it has in our culture that we still you know, are dealing with today. And my audience is over 80% men. When you look at my demographics, I often have anywhere between 20 or 17% female audience. So it's not just women who are listening to me talk about patriarchy in the Bible. If, you know, they're, the, if the critique is good, people are gonna be interested. And I think that there's a lot of room for feminist critique as applied in terms of women's status relative to men in the text being a fundamental problem and what that knock-on structure means for our society. And I'm really excited to you know, connect with other women who um, have similar World, system, you know, world value systems or world approaches to um, join forces so that we can kind of take this conversation forward. Well, and I'll give just one example. And my friend uh, Bernie has a, um, a master's in divinity because he was a born again Christian before he became an atheist. And he had not heard this story even through all that study. And you certainly aren't going to hear it in church. But there is a story about Jephthah's daughter. And Jephthah was a, a fighter and said to God, boy, if you let me beat these Ammonites, I'll just sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my door. So, of course, he wins. He goes back. And his virgin daughter is the first person to come out of the door. And she ends up being sacrificed. She goes into the hills for two months to lament that she's going to die a virgin. But look at the story of Abraham and Isaac. Isaac's the boy. Isaac is going to be killed. But... God stops it and brings a goat on. But in terms of Jephthah's daughter, sorry, not going to save her. You agreed she's done. So women are clearly subordinate. They are a piece of property. And uh, like I said in the appendix of the book, I kind of highlight all of those. I think it's really interesting to read women Christian apologists of how they want to go back and revisit um, the Bible and give it a new interpretation. Well, the bottom line is people have been interpreting that, you know, for 3,000 years, and it's had a lot of bad effects for 3,000 years. You can't just ignore that and try to give it a new approach. And I have yet find to find somebody who could make Jephthah's daughter's uh, story sound good. Yes, or the same with Sarah. Um, you know, the hold of Sarah as being this wonderful wife to Abraham. He whored her out twice. He tried to like sell her off to guys to have sex with, um, pretending that he was his, uh, she was his sister. And um, he had sex with her slave. And then she got like all mad about it. And there was all this sort of like, you know, housewives of, I guess, you know, the, the dusty hills of somewhere in the Middle East, drama going on in their family. So, you know, when they do even construct these narratives about these really great women, they don't take the women in their totality in terms of how their character is, what their characters function as in the Bible. And Sarah is actually not that, I don't think she comes off that great. Um, I don't, you know, she's not really a hero. She doesn't have a lot of agency. She's mostly, you know, defined by her reproductive ability or not. And so even the role models that are very much cast in terms of what men think of women, you know, in those roles is that we don't get Sarah's internal dialogue or anything so much about, you know, her experiences or life. So, yeah, I think it's really difficult for women to go into the Bible and try to find redeeming characters that don't define women in terms of their relationships to men. Well, and I think the story of Sarah is amazing. And I'd written a, a post about this. 
when Abraham in the story, of course, the story, the myth, um, is prepared to uh, sacrifice Isaac, Sarah's nowhere around. She's not consulted. She doesn't have anything to do with it. And the other thing about childbirth is this, this God, Yahweh, takes over reproduction because Sarah was barren. So even those things that we know women do, um, no, God had to intervene in order to create Isaac. So he's taken over the key issue of the female deity, which is reproduction. Right. Um, so we're not even, we don't even have that anymore. Right. Yeah. When um, sort of Baal and Asherah and Yahweh were all sort of vying for supremacy, Yahweh was a war god, but he couldn't deliver babies or for, you know, fertile crops. So you had to have the manna stories and you had to have the fertility stories to prove Yahweh could do everything that Baal and Asherah could do it and backwards and in heels, you know, um, <laughs> in that property, in a com competition, a market of ideas, religious ideas at that time. Uh, yeah, definitely. And that, of course, just aggregates all that power in a masculine god, thereby again, taking more agency or even what you can do in, in your actual life away from, from women. Yeah. So this has been really interesting. Oh, you still there, Karen? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. You just got really quiet. So this has been really interesting and a lot of fun. And I agree. You're right that, you know, we, it's great to see increasing numbers of women coming out about their atheism and showing up and doing activism like you've done. And thank you for, yeah, like just collecting those voices and, and raising those up. And I, I'm looking forward to you coming back on when you have the book out so we can discuss it more and we can do the whole, you know, shameless plugs uh, all over the place for that. So I'm I going to be delighted. Great. Um, so then to wrap things up, uh, if Karen, if you can stick around after the episode, uh, I just want to chat with you a little bit before we sign off. But for everybody else, I hope you've enjoyed the episode and everything that Karen talked about. I'm going to make sure to put links in the description box below so you can go and check that out. And again, if you have content for her website, go ahead and send her an email at Karen at faithlessfeminist.com. All right. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. And we'll see you around pretty soon. Bye.